everyone. <clears throat> Hello again. Um, collaborative care of growth hormone deficiency. Uh, let's see. Growth hormone replacement. Growth hormone is also called somatostatin. Um, it can be kept in a powdered form. That's because it's pretty unstable once you dilute it. Uh, stable for about 14 days if it's refrigerated. And it's given um, based on weight, anywhere from 0.18 to 0 0.3 mics per kilogram per week. It's sub-Q divided into six or seven injections. Um, not to exceed 0 0.7 milligrams per kilogram per weight during puberty. It can also be given as a depot, um, and then it's one and a half milligrams per kilogram per month or 0 0.75 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks. Now, it's not indicated if the patient has a functioning renal allograft. Insulin doses might have to be adjusted in diabetes if they start growth hormone therapy. And then, you know, they have to be careful with this because if there's any scoliosis, there can be progression of scoliosis if there's a rapid growth. And then if, there's, if the child develops any kind of a cancer, then growth hormone has to be stopped. The treatment will be given until the growth plate, plate closes. And you can see here, you have open growth plates, and then you have closed growth plates. For girls, that's usually age 14 to 15. For boys, it's age 15 to 16. Or the other um, stopping point is that the anticipated adult height is reached. Now, the earlier you start treatment, the greater the potential will be. Children who get growth hormone therapy are going to be more susceptible to a slipped capital femoral epiphyses. That is abbreviated SCFE. Um, there's a slight shift of the femur through the growth plate due to a weakness in that growth plate. Um, children with growth hormone deficiency, hypothyroid, or renal disease seem to have an increased risk for the slipped capital femoral epiphysis. Um, when a child who is getting growth hormone therapy complains of hip or knee pain, they have to do a very thorough physical exam, and then if warranted, they'll go ahead and do hip x-rays. Um, I mentioned the scoliosis is another skeletal-related complication. Um, patients with scoliosis who are treated have to have their scoliosis monitored. Um, Parent-patient teaching. Um, compliance is important. A treatment, you know, given until the growth plate closes. Most children who have deficiency who are treated um, will reach normal adult stature, but you want to make sure that there are realistic expectations set. Um, you know, if, if the parents are both under, you know, five foot eight, don't expect your son to be a seven foot five basketball player. That's not reasonable. Initiate growth therapy as soon as possible and continue throughout adolescence to assure the best chance of achieving their height potential. Okay. Now, hyperpituitarism is rare in children. Um, it accounts for 10 to 25 percent of all intracranial tumors. Usually it's a microadenoma, and it's called based on the hormone that it releases. A prolactinoma, these are the most common in children, followed by corticotropinomas and then somatotropinomas. Um, but if you have a um, prolactinoma, you'll have hypogonadism, infertility, amenorrhea, and galactorrhea. If it's a corticotropinoma, you'll end up with Cushing's disease. And if it's a somatotropinoma, somatotropin is the growth hormone, you'll have acromegaly in an adult or giantism in a child. Now, um, I told you that in childs, in childs, in children, prolactinomas are most common. In adults, um, prolactinomas, um, ACTH, and growth hormone are most common. Usually only one hormone is involved. 
usually only one hormone is involved because the cell types within the pituitary gland are very discreetly or organized. Pituitary hormone effects, are gonna, of course, they're going to depend on the hormones involved. The larger the tumor, the more likely it is going to involve more hormones. Your anterior pituitary cells are not going to be equally sensitive to mass effect. The ones that are most sensitive are your somatotropes and your gonadotropes. The cortico and the thyrotropes tend to be more resistant. So those, there are some variances there. Um, the cellar region is a site of various kinds of tumors. Your pituitary adenomas, which are usually benign, are the most common. Um, tumors that are more than 10 millimeters are defined as macroadenomas. If they're smaller than 10 millimeters, then they're microadenomas. Your, most of your pituitary adenomas are going to be microadenomas. Um, I mentioned already that the growth hormone secreting adenomas are rare in children. Now the macroadenomas, they can produce a hormone effect as well as a mass effect. And the mass effect produces your visual difficulties, headache, increased intracranial pressure, and can cause um, intracranial hemorrhage. Now, the um, macroadenomas can produce acromegaly or giantism, depending on when it occurs from excess growth hormone. So for whatever reason, if you have excess growth hormone, you're going to have uh, an excess during, or if you have an excess before puberty, you're going to end up with giantism. It's very rare. The growth is proportional. Growth in all in length of all the bones. Um, giantism is what happens if growth hormone happens in childhood when the open epiphyseal plates allow for excessive longitudinal growth. Affected children can be seven to eight feet tall. They're going to do a thorough evaluation to differentiate this hyperpituitarism from a familial tall stature. That's a normal, normal kid and a kid who's got some giantism. Um, here you see a 12-year-old boy with pituitary giantism. He's six foot five. He's 12. He's 12, guys. Um, six foot five with his mother. You can see the hand of the same patient compared to the hand of an adult male who's six foot one. The patient's middle digit has a circumference of nine centimeters. So this is an adult male who's six foot one, and this is a giant. Um, here's another example. The clinical features of growth hormone excess. Remember Robert, Robert Wadlow, the Alton giant? He was nine pounds at birth, but he was 30 pounds by the time he was six months old. Yikes. By his first birthday, he was 62 pounds. When he died, he was 8 feet 11 inches tall, and he weighed 475 pounds. He died from cellulitis of the feet. He was only 22 years old. Okay, now if growth hormone occurs after puberty, you get increased skeletal thickness and arthralgias. Acromegaly may take 10 years or more to develop clinical manifestations. Um... Early detection and treatment are essential to prevent irreversible changes to soft tissue of face, hands, feet, and skin. The skeletal changes are going to be permanent. I'm going to go ahead and stop with this so I don't have to change my, um, my video. We'll just start right up again.